For the last three weeks, I've taken my SIM card out to the $1,200 iPhone 14 Pro Max and put it into the brand new Nothing Phone 2. And the experience was not at all what I was expecting it to be. So for starters, when you're making a move to a phone that is literally half the price, you expect the first few days to be jarring. And yet all I could think this entire time is, this feels the same. It almost feels like the Phone 2 was built to be a one-to-one -one Android carbon copy of the 14 Pro Max because they have almost exactly the same dimensions. And not just that, the screens are basically the same. <laughs> See if you can guess which one is the Phone 2. It's hard, right? And it's not just the dimensions, even the screens are the same size, including the bezels. Nothing is one of the very few Android companies going to the extent of making sure that the borders all the way around the screen are completely even, which might seem like a small thing, but that symmetry matters to me. In the same way that whenever I clean a room, for example, I'm constantly aligning all the boxes and the papers and the junk just so it's uniform. This is my version of something being organized. And it's a really good screen too. I mean, the colors are basically one-to-one -one with the iPhone, which is to say, vivid, but not so much that it looks like a toy. It's a 120Hz display, which just like the iPhone can dial itself all the way down to 1Hz to enable an always on screen with minimal battery drain. And it's bright. Even in direct sunlight, one of the ways to usually discern cheaper phones is that the screen becomes quite washed out, but not here. The brightness is not quite at the iPhone's level, but very close. And if anything, the fact that the camera cutout is smaller makes this phone screen actually feel more liberated. Now, the resolution of the iPhone screen is higher, as is the resolution of just about every top-end Android phone. But I, even as someone with good vision and an eye for spotting differences, I can barely tell the difference. Every brand puts in super high-res screens because they feel like they have to, but you can tell they know that the vast majority won't notice the difference because they disable the high-res mode by default. I mean, even on my Sony phone, which goes all the way up to 4K, I've set this phone to 1080p, which I mean, it sounds like a crime against humanity. I'm only using a third of the pixels available to me, but I just don't need any more. And so what this all means is that the Nothing Phone 2 hasn't one bit felt like I'm making an aesthetic compromise, which is a big deal coming from a phone that's two times the price. In fact, in a way, you could say this is an aesthetic upgrade. While the iPhone is pretty universally regarded as being a clean, handsome phone, I did a poll on Twitter of some of the best looking flagship phones and it came a very close second, beaten slightly by Samsung's S23 Ultra. The iPhone's designed in a way that it can appeal to the masses, not just to the millions, but to the hundreds of millions. Or in other words, it's very simple. It's not going to offend anyone. Whereas the one luxury of sitting in a niche like nothing currently does is that you can go absolutely bonkers with the design. You want a transparent back? Sure. You want 785 individual LEDs split into 11 segments? Why not? Let's do that too. The phone's got so much personality that if you like it, which I do, then there's a very good chance you're going to love it. And it feels great when you're holding it too. It's lighter than the iPhone, which does make it significantly less tiring to use. The glass on the back is very slightly curved on all sides, which makes my hands feel treated compared to what they're used to handling. And it's pretty great at resisting fingerprints. It's got matte rails, which don't show any prints even if you tried. And then the back is glossy, so it does pick up prints. But because there's so much going on behind the back glass, and because the company stuck with brighter colors than black this time, it's actually never felt to me like my phone is dirty or needs a wipe. If you care a lot about fingerprints, then the white one is probably better than the gray, but the gray is still pretty good. Okay, it's time to address the elephant in the room, or should I say the 785 LEDs in the room. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty bad. They make up what nothing calls the glyph interface, which with their first phone one, I labeled as a bit of a gimmick. I mean, you could do some cool things like check the battery percentage from the back or set up a specific lighting pattern so you could know who's calling without turning your phone over. But it all just felt like stuff that's fun in theory, but impractical in reality. Like who's really gonna sit there staring at the back of their phone, trying to figure out what light pattern is shining? Like, is this my fiance or is this my mum? So? nothing's improved them. For starters, there's more options. So with ringtones, for example, you've now got a pretty sizable library of pre-made ones, including some notable highlights like Woo Yeah. You've got Glyph Composer that lets you use the pre-built tools to make your own, or you can go completely custom. You can import whatever track you want and the glyphs will sort of sync up to the rhythm of that track. Pretty cool, right? And a sub to the channel would be two, Terrific. But seriously, if you can help us overtake Apple, it will be amazing, and we are less than two million away. 
You can now use the glyph as a timer. You can use it as an indicator of your current volume level. You can use it to show you when Google Assistant is listening to what you're saying. I really like how you can assign certain notifications priority. Like you can say, if I get an email, or you can actually go as far as to say that if I get a WhatsApp message from this specific contact, then only that will light up the glyph on the back, which is an indicator to me that I know I need to check my phone. And then probably the coolest glyph feature is an integration into third party apps. So let's say I wanna take an Uber to the town center. The back of the phone can tell you the time till pickup. It's at the stage now where I'm still not finding myself using the glyphs very often. A lot of these things, they are still easier and less faffy to do using the screen of your phone. And the only third party app that works is Uber, but I see it. I see the vision and I like the vision. Oh, I forgot to cancel the Uber. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Station, yeah. yeah. So we're here now. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that I see the vision and I like the vision of a phone that when you're at dinner, you just keep on the table face down. You'd be in the moment, but you still have that like mental ease that you know you're not missing out on anything. I think it's very easy to say to someone, well, just don't check your phone at dinner. But then for a lot of people in a lot of jobs, including me and mine, making sure that things happen on time with this video, for example, you just have to be reachable in case an unexpected issue crops up. And so the fact that this thing can genuinely allow me to be on my phone less while avoiding that creeping feeling that something might have gone wrong or I should probably just check is a really positive thing. And while it does need wider app integration for me to genuinely say it will change the way I use my phone, I do have faith in the company's willingness to support it. I mean, a lot of the things that they've developed specifically for Phone 2 are already being brought to Phone 1. Sorry, do you mind if we turn around and go back? So, yeah, I'll change it on the app. Thank you. And that brings me on to the software. So this thing is running Nothing OS 2, which is a skin based on Android 13. And in a lot of ways, this is how I would make the software if I was going to do it myself. It's clean, for starters. I mean, everything from the core system animations, the boot up screen, the wake from standby, the status bar pull down, the way it scrolls web pages, the way the home screen responds, to the fingerprint scanner, the way it looks, the way it reacts, and it's reliable too, in my experience. Plus, this is a fast phone. And everything feels tuned towards speed, but in a way that's still graceful. If smartphones were chocolate bars, then using this doesn't feel like a Kit Kat or a Twix. This feels like a really indulgent, handmade chocolate fudge brownie. It's not flashy, it's not colorful, but it's rich. And speaking of the lack of color, this is a very atypical smartphone home screen, right? I don't think I really understood it when I first looked at it. All I could think was, why are you making it harder to see which icon is which? If you have a color screen, why not use the color? But the more that I've gotten used to it, the more I think I get it. So when you switch on your phone, you're already looking for a very specific app, your fingers know where that app is because they've got the muscle memory. So everything being black and white doesn't really interfere with that. It doesn't make anything that you need to do slower. It's only when you come out of the app that you turned your phone on for. And you're in that situation where you're deciding whether to return to your real life or jump into another different app, that's when everything being monochrome kicks in. It makes that option feel less appealing. They've actually just a couple of days ago dropped a new update which can auto apply this monochrome theme over not just the apps that have had custom icons specifically made for them, but every app, which is exactly how it should be. It's very much singing the same tune as the Glyph system. Be in the real world, be present, take back control over these apps, which I'm a big believer in. But there are some downsides. It's a little buggy, for example. There've been some very infrequent stutters when you perhaps do something the phone isn't expecting you to do. The auto applying black and white themes seems to, on a few apps, just make them black. And the phone always seems to glitch for like a split second every single time the always on display activates. Benefit of the doubt, this is still an early build of the Phone 2 software. And to be fair, it's already more stable than what the Phone 1 launched with. But also, it's not the most feature-rich Android skin out there. If you've picked up a Vivo phone recently, the amount of choice you get is insane. You can pick your fingerprint scanning icon, you have a billion camera modes and filters, and every type of animation that exists on the device, you can control. I mean, apart from the glyph system, which is an obvious advantage, this thing has, you can choose your icon pack, you can choose your wallpaper, and... That's all, folks. But I do want to stress that the broad strokes of what is going on with Nothing OS are peak Android. I was quite surprised to find that even the battery and the audio are not compromised either. The Phone 2 has a 4,700 milliamp hour cell, which is solid, but it performs better than solid. Maybe because nothing's using an older chip on this phone, so they've had more time to optimize it. Maybe because nothing's only been working on one phone this whole time. Meanwhile, most of their competitors have had to split their time and resources across 50. Maybe because the phone automatically dark modes every single app. Whatever the reason, I'm keeping my Wi-Fi on, my data on, 
my Bluetooth on, my speakers at like 80% volume, I'm living the life. And for me, as a heavy user, I'm just about getting to the seven hours of screen on time mark every single day. Seven hours of screen on time, I would say is more than 98% of the population probably needs. And then the speakers. Thank you very much. You've had a glow up. This is the iPhone 14 Pro Max. It's very balanced sound and it's still one of the best sounding phones on the market. And this is the Phone 2. You'll find that the Phone 2 is a tiny bit bassier. I'd say it has a tiny bit less clarity, but then it's also louder, which is not a bad outcome at all. And I guess the key takeaway here is that it's not felt one bit jarring for me, moving to this as my main YouTube and media consumption device. Then when I watch our videos on this, I'm constantly finding myself bopping along to the music because it sounds the way that we intend that it too. So what on earth is going on here? How is it that this phone has an extremely similar looking display and yet lasts most of the time longer? That it's got an entire extra layer packed with hundreds of LEDs while being lighter? And that it's got more design flair but sits at half the price? Well, part of the equation is that nothing is definitely absorbing more of the cost than Apple are and they're taking less profit per phone. Or in other words, the price that they're charging for this is just reasonable. I mean, it's $599, so it's definitely a tier more expensive than a whole swathe of good Androids you can get for closer to 400, but it feels close enough to a flagship when you're using it, but you don't feel like you've just got screwed by overpaying for a mid-ranger. That said, it's not quite a flagship, and there's three places where I'm particularly noticing it. First is the haptics. See, I like to set my keyboard to have vibrations on when I hit each key. I just think it makes it feel a little bit more like you're actually typing, but anything more than really subtle vibrations starts to feel tiring. The phone too, while it doesn't have the worst vibration experience, it's not one of those horrible sounding phones where it feels like there's something loose inside. It's also not high end enough to be able to set the vibration to as subtle of a setting as I would like it to. Be. Second is the cameras, and this is probably the most visually obvious way that the company has saved. I mean, you only need to look at the back of this phone to see how this phone's priorities are very different to say this phone's priorities. I mean, probably the fairest comparison would be this versus a Google Pixel 7. Both are $599, both have one main camera, one ultra wide, and one front camera. I mean, the detail's on par, but the dynamic range, not so much, especially in those really tricky scenarios where you've got a dark patch in the same frame as literally the sun. It struggles to keep up. You also notice that it doesn't have the investment in those really advanced features like Google does. Things like automatically unblurring faces and real tone, which is really good at making sure that people's skin tones look the way that they're meant to. So while it's not at all hard to get pretty shots out of this set of cameras, you will also likely find that your facial colors can vary between consecutive shots from the same scene. Yes, this is a real selection of photos. Yes, I stopped because I thought the deer was gonna kill me. And likewise, even though neither phone has a zoom camera, Google's intelligence means that zooming in via digital zoom is still pretty crisp all the way to five or six times. Nothing, not so much. The night mode is good though. I'm really liking how the phone is so aggressive with making sure that all the really bright spots are kept under control. And the video quality is not offensive. It's not gonna look like there's a problem, but it also doesn't shine as bright as other phones. Oh yeah, and it gets worse if you go to the front camera. I mean, for starters, if I put myself up against a brightly lit backdrop like the sky over here, this phone has no idea what to do. It doesn't know how to expose that and my face correctly at the same time. Plus, the Phone 2's front camera is limited to 1080p video recording, which, you know, $600 phone, 2023, is not the best. It means that even when everything is going in this phone's favour, it's still kind of the ceiling is capped. And then the third key compromise with the Phone 2 is the chip. So this is running the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, which is basically the best of the best for last year. Now, I actually think this is a smart move because there's not many applications that are really gonna benefit from having the absolute latest. They've managed to save a large amount of cost, some of which is clearly being passed on to the buyer and it's given them lots of time to optimize for it. So let me be very clear, nothing feels slow or last gen on the phone too. It's perfectly nippy for all those quick in and out internet searches. And funnily enough, I've actually been struggling to get past a certain level on a game I'm playing on my iPhone because there's too much going on and the phone keeps crashing. This phone didn't struggle and actually allowed me to complete the level, but not having the very latest is still a caveat. It means this is not as powerful as the very, very top end phones. It means it won't have the very latest 5G modem. It doesn't support the absolute newest Wi-Fi and Bluetooth standards. So something to bear in mind. So overall, has nothing improved? 
or has nothing improved? Well, I think that the Nothing Phone 2 is a way more confident phone than the Phone 1. It knows what it's trying to be. It's a thoughtful device that feels like it's designed by real people. And I'm genuinely excited to see that in ways it's starting to hit those lofty objectives it's set for itself. It's an easy recommend. Sadly, one thing the Phone 2 can't do is record in full 360. For that, you're going to want to use the Insta360 X3. And let's be very clear, shooting in 360 is not some fun novelty that allows you to warp your footage in these weird, wonderful ways. The real benefit is that this camera can capture everything happening around you at the same time in full 5.7K resolution. So that you can shoot first, be in the moment, enjoy yourself, and then later on reframe to focus on what you want to focus on. All with this incredibly trippy third-person out of body experience that normal cameras just can't capture because the selfie stick becomes invisible in the shot. It feels like magic. You could even use this three meter stick to create a drone-like perspective following you. It's got a surprising level of stabilization. It automatically levels the horizon for you. It's waterproof up to 10 meters. And hey, if you want your life to be even more hassle-free, the Insta360 app can edit your videos for you using artificial intelligence to sync the best bits to the beat of the music. And if you get one using my special link in the description, you get a 5% discount you get a 128 gigabyte SD card and the invisible selfie stick all for free.